This photograph was taken by a vicar in his church. What can explain the eerie figure by the altar? When this girl's photograph was taken in 1917, were there really fairies at the bottom of a Yorkshire garden? This weird picture of a London bus was taken by a man who claims he could think photographs straight onto film. Can the camera really capture the psychic <coughs> world? Mysteries from the files of Arthur C. Clarke, scientist, writer and visionary. The scientist who invented the communication satellite, the writer of 2010. And now in retreat in Sri Lanka, the visionary who ponders the riddles of this and other worlds. Investigating the supernatural can be a very frustrating experience. So much depends on second-hand reports and eyewitnesses' powers of observation. Yet, a single good photograph could settle the matter once and for all. Most apparently psychic photographs seem to turn up by accident. But in the 1960s, one man claimed that he could take them at will. His name was Ted Sirios, and he asserted that he could imprint images on film merely by thinking at the camera. Ted Sirius called his technique photography. He usually used Polaroid cameras, and sometimes extraordinary photographs emerged. Blurred and distorted, but often showing buildings miles away from the cameras. This 1967 session was organized by Ted's champion, psychiatrist Dr. Jewel Eisenbud. Today, Ted and Jewel are reunited for another photographic test. Dr. Eisenbud has taken time off from his busy practice. Pausing only to collect essential supplies, they're bound for Dr. Eisenbud's cabin outside Denver in the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. In his heyday, Ted astonished the psychic world with his performance as a photographer. When he was hot, when he was in the groove, what happened was that first he would start by alternating whiteies and blackies. Blackies is total obstruction of the light, no light getting in. Whiteies is total overexposure, which shouldn't have been. Then the pictures would start getting darker and darker and darker, and then he would start to imprint parts of people or scenes. Like this church in Germany, where Ted had never been, or this blurred writing identified as a sign from a Mounties building. But in Ted's version, the word Canadian seems to be misspelt. This is a Stanger Wing airplane. This is what Ted got. Here you will notice that the strut here is an inverted V. Up here he has re-inverted it so that this is his typical signature. Now this type of rearrangement is exactly what we do in dreams. Exactly. No, don't even trigger it. When I say now, uh, oh, something mm. bang like that. I got a good idea. Could Ted have been cheating? Impossible, says Eisenbud. Ted was continually observed by dozens of people, sometimes six, eight in a session. Ted usually held a tube of paper in front of the lens. He called it his gizmo and said it helped concentrate his thoughts. Ted's last photograph was of curtains, but that was ten years ago. Can he produce anything now? I'm after one thing, and that's a person that's whole in something.
Okay. okay. But all he got was his face. Now you press the button. All right. Good. Undaunted, Ted and Jewel work on into the night. Trying everything they know to recapture the spirit of success. Come on, take some film juice. <laughs> you know. Randy's gonna <clears throat> like this is uh, <laughs> We hey, did this uh, night oh. after night for three years. <clears throat> The sessions would last six, eight hours, and at the beginning, nothing would happen. But later, in those original sessions, weird pictures would often emerge. How did it happen? Two observers who watched Ted in action for a whole weekend suspected his gizmo, the rolled-up tube of paper. Charles Reynolds and David Eisendrath, experts in both photography and conjuring, Speculate that Ted might have used the gizmo to hide a pocket magnifying lens with a tiny slide stuck on the end. By taking a piece of a transparency, a piece of a photographic transparency, and fastening it across the end, when light passes through the transparency and then through the lens, is picked up by the optical system of the Polaroid camera, and voila, it becomes uh, a photographic image. This is Big Ben, and let's just see how it looks on your camera. Using a device like this, they reckon Ted could have produced any picture he wanted. Charlie is going to hold it. The light from the wink light is going to bounce off of Charlie's shirt and jacket and pass through this lens, through the lens of the camera, and hopefully make a good image on the film. Now, you want to mask off as much of that lens yeah. as you can now. Thing. Yeah, all right. Now, uh, you must realize that when Ted is doing this, a great deal of chaos is taking place. And it's very possible that he could have ditched that, as I just did. Uh, uh, and when they said, let me see this thing, he could say, yeah, I'll look at it, you know. And in the meantime, he's drinking beer, and people are running around, and a great deal is happening. And uh, it's very, very easy under those circumstances um, for somebody to do this. You don't even have to be a magician. So have Reynolds and Eisendrath proved that Ted was never psychic? Uh, I cannot say that he doesn't have supernatural or extraterrestrial powers, but in three days, I never saw him do anything that led me be to believe that he did have them. Of all alleged psychic photographs, Perhaps the most famous are these of fairies in a Yorkshire Glen. Frances Griffiths has brought her daughter to see the house in Cottingley, where she lived with her cousin Elsie Wright during the First World War. It's pretty village, and I thought, what's nice? Where's the back? Well, the back's only corner around there. Frances and Elsie used to go down to play by the back the stream at the bottom of the garden. And it was by that stream, they said, that in 1917, they took photographs of fairies. That summer, 10-year-old Frances kept falling into the bank and getting into trouble. When her mother asked her why she went there, she said to see the fairies.